this is Paul Paul Agee's video that I reviewed on my own. Um, I keep looking at that camera. I should be looking at this one. Uh, called the the case for heaven is dismissed, where he's talking about near death experiences. And I said that um, I couldn't really give much of a thought on the Kim uh, Kim's experience with Maria's shoe because I didn't know enough about it. Well, now we have Kim with us, so we can go over properly. And the arguments that Paul brings forward from someone who does know the case inside and out because she was the one that was there. Yeah, and, and I might add before we start, I have no interest in being defensive. Feeling defensive is uncomfortable for anybody because it's back to, oh, you're a liar, you know. Yes. Uh, so I'm, you know, emotionally, I'm not uh, feeling defensive, but I would love to respond with facts. Yes, that, that's the best way. Absolutely. As soon as emotion gets involved, you kind of subconsciously try to begin attacking the person that's attacking you. Well, not really attacking, but I've crossed that line. But <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I know, you know, I've, I've had people who have commented on some of my videos and have said things to me that I don't particularly like, and it does hit you hard when it's about you personally. Yeah. Um, but you've got to as I say remain ob objective as possible. So let let's see um, back to what Paul said about Maria's shoe. I hate to ask what your third best example is. And so we have a famous case of a woman who um, who, who was clinically dead, yeah. and she describes how her soul separated from her body. When she came back into her body and was telling people about this, she said, by the way... Just before we get in, I just want to check on that first, that first quote that Maria talked about her soul leaving her body. Did she talk about that, or did she just say that her consciousness was outside of her body? Neither. Just the word soul, she didn't. You didn't use soul or consciousness. Are you kidding me? No, because people didn't talk like that. That's like recent words. In the 70s, there were no one talked about souls that I knew of or consciousness, and certainly not Maria. She just said what she saw mm. and how she got there. You know, that it was like that. I mean, she mm. didn't travel, but that I saw this there, I saw that in the emergency room, mm. she was no more. She just said that she was outside her body or that she was just she here. That. She just talked mm. about what she saw. Mm. Yeah. So this is, this is the problem when you keep retelling stories, especially from someone. This is uh, the video that Paul's responding to, that we're responding to in Inception, is um, a guy called Lee Strobel, who's, whose video is talking about um, evidence for heaven, I believe. So it seems that he's projecting somewhat his idea of soul onto this story. As, in, as you say, that's not what happened. Or, nor have I ever used that word. I don't put mm. that in this category. I put mm. it into uh, a, a no category. I don't know how to categorize it, but mm. no. Okay, sure. Well, let's, let's continue. Um, who, who was clinically dead. Yeah. And she describes how her soul separated from her body. When she came back into her body and was telling people about this, she said, by the way, while I was floating up there on the third floor ledge of the hospital, there's a, a man's blue tennis shoe. Well, then they go up and they find, yes, here it is, exactly as she said. Okay, here we go. The 1977 case of Maria, as described to the world by her social worker, Kimberly Clark. In 1996, researchers Hayden Ebern and Sean Mulligan visited Seattle to interview Clark personally and- Do you know of this study? I know the deception of it. Right. It was, okay. Well, let, let's. Um, did, did they? Did they? And it was deceptive from the get go. Mm -hmm. did, did, did they come to? Yeah. These. These. Uh, two of these people were students. They came to a Seattle Ions meeting from Canada, from a small college in Canada, um, without identifying their agenda. And, uh, but attended a meeting and because I'm at, you know, I teach at the college level and have for decades, I really, you know, cared to accommodate them. Can you show us where you saw the you shoe? Sure. Yeah, it was just, uh, it was a trust issue. And I, um, what can I do? I can't go back in time. Turns out that they were sent there by this uh, professor or uh, I'm not sure he's even a professor. I don't know who he is. Anyway, they did not represent what they were there for. I showed them where the shoe is, and they wound up writing an article based on um, things that were not available to them that were available to me. 
and to Maria and to the medical team. Um, so, uh, and it saddened me because the support group I lead is important to the people who need support and their loved ones and people who attend who are afraid of dying and people who attend who are dying. And their first report was, well, there was no science involved at all. It's a support group, boys. You know, there's, I'm not there to uh, put up my, my PowerPoint and, and teach. Mm -hmm. I'm there to, as a social worker, to validate and support. So right off the bat, it was like, they didn't get it. This meeting doesn't occur for scientific reasons. It's emotional and psychological support. End of story. Then, uh, but then, so that was at the meeting and that's what they reported about that. So right away there was discounting. And, um, and then I showed them where the shoe was and they took photos and then uh, decided that I easily could have seen the shoe and they have a photo of the ledge except that they were down the block and across the street because at that time, major construction was happening at Harborview on that side of the building. And by the way, most of the stuff I've described is now erased, but the line of windows is still there. <laughs> but boy, it's, it's, you know, the building next to it, they built a building next to it, took away right. most things. So yeah, if I'd gone across the street and down the block and taken a picture of, you know, the building, probably could have seen the shoe. Uh, again, I decided to go inside. It was a decision made on weather and my own safety and all that. So, uh, that so was just just um, just briefly. So you say you you could across the street. So where where was the cliff you were mentioning? To the west. So it, it was here's the building, emergency driveway, underground parking. That's underground. That didn't help. I couldn't see if I went underground to the parking <laughs> park. Uh, and then that cliff. Right. It's a drop. It, and then it drops down to an interstate highway. Um, mm -hmm. I never thought about crossing the street and going down the block to an affordable housing mm -hmm. uh, apartment. Right. And, and, that's what occurred to me. And you Fuck didn't that. arrive, you don't arrive to the hospital from that direction. So you wouldn't have been there for any reason. No, no, it's not. And, and neither would Maria because the emergency room is before that perspective. Then they went inside of the building and went to rooms and placed a shoe on a ledge and then went back outside and took a photo again from that distance. Um, that alarmed me and it way alarmed the hospital and good thing that they live in Canada because this became, their intrusion actually became a big deal because that floor also now holds, by the time they were there, uh, people with contagious diseases. Also, you cannot walk into any hospital in this country and just walk in and plant a shoe and be walking among patients and family and all mm. that. They got past security. They didn't check into anything. And it, it could have been a dangerous situation for the people needing acute care there. Um, so just on a, a moral standpoint, and, and for me, if they're going to go to such lengths, um, I began, I, I would be suspicious of that anyway, because they were really trying to uh, prove a point. They came in, like I said, with an agenda, not to, not to hear or understand disprove to debunk to disprove at yeah. any cost okay and, um and then well, let's um about it. yeah okay well, let, let's see where uh, paul goes from here because i'm sure he'll mention some of what you just said okay. visit harborview medical center the location of this famous event it seems clark herself was the discoverer of the shoe found not by exiting to the roof as deceptively depicted in lee's movie but instead was spotted from inside by looking out. And is that the picture from across the street? Yeah, and you see the windows, how low they are. Yeah. But they're not low enough to cover a shoe if I'm in the hallway. Ooh, this is, right. I've seen a close-up of this. That's not the shoe on the ledge, by the way. They put no, that shoe 
That was the shoot, and then right. when okay. the telephoto lens, they are at a great distance. You can tell by the fuzzy quality. Anyway, they're not close yeah. to the shoe. But since I haven't already described the configuration of the windows, you can see. And now put a two-tiered metal table with towels and such in front of it. And that's why I had to go in. Again, not the first room where that happened. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I couldn't remember where exactly the room was. I wasn't tracking. I, I didn't even know I'd be sharing the story. But it was on the third floor on the west side and uh, somewhere in the middle. So mm -hmm. when they asked me what room, I just said, well, I wasn't sure exactly, but, you know, that one would do. It was, again, I, I didn't know what their goal was. Mm. So, But um, I suppose regardless, from where you were stood looking for the shoe from outside, would you have been able to have a view of the shoe like that from where you were? What was obstructing the view? Probably. Yeah, if, the sh if I could have seen the shoe from the ledge, I would have... Uh, then gone up to that floor into that room and got the shoe that alone would have been spectacular it just mm. so happens i couldn't see it on the sidewalk that hugged the building at that time now these features are gone but at that time there was a sidewalk that didn't go all the way around the building either but it went along this part of the building and um i didn't see a shoe so okay. either i wasn't looking carefully or uh, I was too close to the building. Mm -hmm. Okay, so main point being, although this picture here is what the researchers saw from a long distance away, you yourself, when you went out looking for it, didn't have any view like that. You wouldn't, you weren't able to see the shoe I at all. Was next to that. This is concrete, and I was next to that. Right. Um, okay. Because that's where the sidewalk was. I mean, I don't have to even remember that. That's where mm -hmm. I remember the sidewalk. Um, and again. So what? The shoe was there, period. So it, mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter. Did I, you know, why didn't I notice it when I was outside? What's, that's not even relevant. There was mm -hmm. a shoe on a ledge spotted by somebody who was dead. I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting. I suppose, you know, the um, what they would, and I, I suppose Paul, if I can remember rightly, will go into this, but they're kind of, um, considerations that maybe when Maria was wheeled in, this view was available to her. She could have seen this view. Oh, no, 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 no. Again, emergency rooms on the north side of the building, first floor. Maria's room was immediately above there on the second floor, but the north end of the building. That shoe was in the center part of a building, completely different section, as a matter of fact, built at a different time than the north end. And Nothing that Maria was exposed to involved that side of the building at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no there there. There's there would be. Why would it, you know, uh, an, an ongoing uh, resuscitation? Because that's what was going on in the vehicle. It wasn't an ambulance. It was part of Medic One coronary care unit on wheels. Why would they decide to like take a tour around the hospital? I mean, it just, no, she wasn't mm -hmm. there. She was right. She, ongoing resuscitation did not even stop in the emergency room but because that's routine. That's protocol. Right up to the second floor, north end. Again, second floor, north end of a massive building. Um, shoe found center of the building on the third floor. And that perspective was west. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's continue. Out of a patient window. Clark is the only witness to the details. The shoe was not photographed. No notes are known to have been taken. And the current whereabouts of this shoe of near mythic status is also unknown. It's in your garage. It's your garage. Dude, come over. <laughs> <laughs> and also, again, this wasn't in isolation. This is a huge hospital um, with a lot of employees. And she was there for three weeks with a shoe. Mm. But so what? But this, this, so, um... what? so what? So what mm. the shoe is where about the shoe does not define the case. Mm. This this picture that they've taken there is is that also a long distance? That doesn't look that far away from the they're, hospital. They're across the street. Some, I wasn't with them when they took these pictures. But they're mm. across the street, and you can see the construction. So they could not 
walk along the sidewalk and get my viewpoint. See that fence, <laughs> that mm -hmm. construction fence? Evidence right there that they could not retrace my steps. Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't. So they went from a distance and stuck a flag in and said, oh, now we know. Okay, fair enough. Again, if I had gone across the street, it would have saved me a lot of time. But I still would have seen the shoe, so it doesn't matter. The mm. point is that there's a shoe on a ledge. And the greater question also is, who puts the shoe on a ledge? I mean, what <laughs> yeah, there yeah. Oh, indeed. Okay. Ebron and Mulligan placed the shoe on the ledge Clark identified and found it to be plainly visible from the ground and also clearly visible from multiple interior vantage points. Any thoughts on that? Only what I've already said. Uh, again, mm. I didn't go down the street and across the street. And I went from room to room to room from the hallway because it was easy to see. That's true. Unless there was a two-tiered metal cart with stuff on it in the way, which means I had to go in and look down. Mm. Per the researchers, it is not a far-fetched notion to assume that anyone who might have noticed the shoe back in 1977 would have commented on it because of the novelty of its location. Thus, during the three days prior to her NDE, Maria could have overheard such a conversation among any of the doctors, nurses, patients, visitors, or other hospital staff who frequented this busy area. Memory researchers are well aware that people can hear snippets of conversation outside of their focal awareness and recall the contents in various forms, including visual images, even though they honestly believe they never encountered the information before. This is known as cryptomnesia. Oh, I love a big word. Sadly, <laughs> again, what? Um, uh, the ambulance driveway kept anyone probably interested in being healthy from doing anything but darting across the driveway. And I, I got to tell you, I did it plenty of times myself because I parked in that garage and I was lazy. So I went out a sideway and I would dash across the driveway and make jokes about it. Um, even wrote about it, actually, in my own book about what that was like. Uh, I called it the gauntlet. <laughs> People who would have that perspective are wanting to not be hit by a fast moving ambulance. And I'm not sure why anyone would look up anyway and notice a shoe. If they did, I didn't hear about it. Um, and I was conscious. Uh, I don't know of anyone that I met on staff and again, more and more people were coming by to look at the shoes, like the Shroud of Turin of Harborview, who said, oh yeah, I saw that shoe. There's no report of it. Also, who's to say that shoe wasn't left there by the guy who had just checked out or maybe had died. It was that kind of a floor. I mean, where people were very sick. Um, that shoe might have just been out there. And I, one, one thing I thought about with the shoe, and by the way, once you start hearing about shoes in odd places, you're going to start <laughs> in odd places. So listeners and Darren, your awareness has just been elevated because it's so odd. What is a shoe doing on the side of a road? I mean, don't you notice that you only have one shoe? Um, I'm wondering, we live in a very rainy climate, if somebody hadn't, I don't know. I don't know why a shoe was out there. Maybe there were two shoes to dry and then one fell off. I, I don't know. But uh, from a skeptical point of view, in summation, it was never reported to me by any staff person, cafeteria level and above, because everybody knew it about eventually, that they remembered seeing a shoe outside. And that would be noted. It would be. It's not a seagull. We have plenty of seagulls, and that wouldn't be noted. A, a shoe and a ledge, meh. Yeah. Also, no evidence that that shoe had been there for days and days. It could have been there for minutes and minutes. That person could have just been discharged to the morgue or otherwise without a shoe. And by the way, otherwise would include a care facility 
and um, people leave belongings all behind when they transfer from a hospital to uh, another facility. It's, it, it's not uncommon. I forgot my robe or my shoes or whatever. There's a million scenario, not a million, I exaggerate, there's an embellishment. Uh, but there are many ways to look at this, and uh, I don't know why she was there. I don't know why no one saw it, and there's no evidence, again, that it was there for any length of time. Mm. So with Maria's um, state for the three days prior to the near-death experience that Paul was talking about, was she in um, any position where she may have, if somebody, say, did see the shoe, but that, that knowledge never came back to you for whatever reason. Was, was there any possibility that Maria could have heard, overheard it, maybe even, even if she was unconscious? If someone working on the coronary care unit, and that would include more than nurses and doctors and social workers and respiratory therapists, that would be janitorial services, food services, x-ray, MRI. I mean, there's all kinds of technicians that come in. There are a lot of people that weave in and out of intensive care unit situations. And uh, who knows? However, mm. that person never came forward, ever, mm. in a great length of time to go, oh yeah, I saw that shoe. No one ever did, which leads yes. me to yes. conclude no one saw it. Mm. And reasonably so, and it, it'd be interesting to me why that shoe would have remained there if someone would have seen it and no one would have just gone out and reached and pick it, picked it out you know, just thrown it away or something. They left it on the, on yeah, the window ledge. I think that would have mm. happened, which makes me wonder, uh, even in this conversation, if it wasn't someone who had just been discharged, um, because do things do get along. And, and if the person was gone, and I, I will say, and I, I don't mean this in a disparaging way at all, I really don't, but Harborview is also an inner city hospital. We have many indigent people to this day who are admitted, uh, who are impaired and maybe even have one shoe to their name or no shoes or whatever that previous patient might have been one of those i don't know i mean mm. we can just sit here all day and suppose that then we're no better than the people who are writing this there's indeed so we can I'm only work with what we know position well like they have because mm -hmm. i like sticking to facts yes and I agree. Okay, let's continue. Kimberly Clark is not a trained investigator, and she did not publicly report the details of Maria's NDE until seven years after it occurred. It is quite possible that during this interval, some parts of the story were forgotten, and some details may have been interpolated. As Clark has not produced notes or recordings from her interviews of Maria, we have no way of knowing what leading questions Maria may have been asked or what Maria may have recalled that did not fit and was dropped from the record to further. I suppose in a way he, he's right that because we don't have recordings of that, there's no way of, sh of proving outside of your own testimony. Oh, oh for a smartphone back <laughs> in the day. Oh, yeah, I think yeah. it's so different now. But also, even if I had a smart, smartphone, I don't know if I would have recorded it. I wasn't there to disparage and challenge people I was there to support and care for people. So, and that, I don't know where this, I didn't report it for seven years comes from. That's simply not true because I reported it immediately. Viva Zapata, that was the report and the nurse and then on and on and on. So I don't know, I, I would have to ask him where he got the seven year time frame. So, I, so perhaps, perhaps he means it didn't, it didn't reach media or a publication until seven years after, or maybe that's when you wrote the, your book. No, I mean, no. Wrote, wrote, the mid nineties. Uh, I have no idea. I have no hmm. idea. Uh, I don't know what he's talking about, but no, I didn't write it up or publish it because I was going to, but that was my first case. Oh, another thing he said I'd like to address leading questions. I didn't ask Maria any questions at all. I was there in response to the nurse who was concerned about her physical state and her level of agitation and the risk of it irritating her heart. And she'd just been in cardiac arrest that day and didn't want that to happen. I asked no questions. I just responded to the nurse and said, what's up? And the nurse told me, and then I 
we couldn't find the translator. It was like a long period of time, frankly, in my memory. Mm. Um, but thereafter, I absolutely asked leading questions, and I'll own it. I went to every person that had been resuscitated, as I've already said, and said, what do you remember about being dead? I mean, that's a leading question. <laughs> I didn't ask it of Maria. Sure. Then I suppose um, your counter-argument could be why... If this was a, a, such a phenomenal experience for you or, or a phenomenal case for you, why then didn't you write down any notes after, you know, immediately after talking to her or something like that, say that we had documentation? Um, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't have done. I would have been too amazed. But If there was a place to chart, I would have. Uh, charting is called SOAP. And here everybody gets an old medical lessons. But uh, we had to chart at the University of Washington in a method called SOAP, which is subjective, objective assessment and plan. Uh, if it fit if the shoe fit into that required format i would have charted it and i may have i don't remember that i don't remember i remember the shoe story only because it's just out there and i've had to talk about it so much again it's not the only uh observation of a remote object that i've come across in someone i've interviewed who's had a near-death experience uh, what was the thing about no scientific background I'm not a scientist. Um, Thank you for clarifying. I'm a social worker. Um, it says, yeah, Kimberly Clark is not a trained investigator and she did not publicly report the details. So, yeah. Eh. But I don't think you ever claimed to be, have you? I'm not. I'm not an investigator. I'm, I wasn't on the job to be an investigator. I wasn't hired by the University of Washington and put on critical care to be an investigator. So, mm. no, no, no. And... Uh, what would I be, a crime reporter? I don't even know what a trained investigator does outside of criminal justice system, unless mm. as a researcher. And I've already complained about how there's very little of that lack of money on the subject. So not many people are trained mm. investigators in this subject. Yeah, I suppose the point being here is that um, as you're not a trained investigator or a trained researcher, you may not know how to interpret what you saw objectively or critically, I suppose, is, is going to be the point raised. Yeah, and I would agree. I might have um, reached down and picked up a pair of underpants and then decided it to be a shoe. But what happened is that I picked up a shoe. But um, yeah, I wasn't investigating. I wasn't tracking evidence. I was just being a gal on the job with no other motive or interest, as a matter of fact, at that time. It is quite possible that during this interval, some parts of the story were forgotten and some details may have been interpolated. As Clark has not produced notes or recordings from her interviews of Maria, we have no way of knowing what leading questions Maria may have been asked or what Maria may have recalled that did not fit and was dropped from the record to further complicate did maria mention anything other than the shoe being seen yes i told you uh, first looking down accurately yes, describing right. who was in the room and the equipment being right. used, including that paper producing machine and then like that being outside above the emergency room seeing ambulances curvature of the driveway automatic door opening so she had to be out the window, not looking down anyway, because of that roof that I mentioned, mm -hmm. and then the shoe. And uh, she might have seen other things along the way. I don't remember her reporting them. Complicate matters. Clark claims to have had her own near death experience in 1970. Could this be a point of bias, coloring her perception and reporting of Maria's experience? <laughs> Could it? <laughs> sure but why i mean what would uh, i want to go back to i claim to have had a near-death experience sir you don't get to tell me i claim anything that happens to me that includes my marriage my uh, church attendance what i say to neighbors i mean you know so just right there that's uh annoying that I claim to have a near-death experience. I had a near-death experience 
without knowing it was called a near-death experience. But during two resuscitations, I had a memory of a whole bunch of stuff uh, without a, a map, without a, a context. Um, so uh, in a way that's true because Maria did, finding the shoe, that experience did validate my own near-death experience. Um, but I don't believe I was influenced towards that direction. I would say I was uh, going the opposite direction. I was the best and the worst witness for Maria because I didn't know what had happened to me. And it wasn't, um, there just, you know, at that time there was nothing that I'd come across on the subject. Uh, it was, a, it was just, uh, I didn't know what it was. It didn't fit anything. Mm -hmm. But because of my own opinion of my own experience, which was like, what the heck happened? Um, I was skeptical of my own experience. And uh, because it, I didn't make sense. So that's why when Maria was telling me about who was in the room and what was going on, I could account for it all from a skeptical point of view, except for that paper thing. When she was outside of the emergency room, it was a skeptical in me that went, oh, but someone from housekeeping could have pushed her bed by the window so she could look down, forgetting that there's a roof, of course. I'm not a yeah. good skeptic, as it turns out. Um, so it was not to my advantage at the time that I went looking for this object to think, oh, this might have an application to my own life. So there was nothing preceding it, leading up to it or anything. It benefited me because mm. it was like, oh, wow, mm. I, this happened to me. Yes. It benefited a lot of people thereafter when I asked, what do you remember from being dead? That leading question. And then all the people that I have been in service to since then. Since but, then yeah. but, you know, he, what does he know? I mean, I, what do I know? I was the only person there, but uh, I don't feel like I led anything because I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the outcome of this search. It was mm -hmm. just, again, a, a day at work. So I suppose what, what Paul's implying in, in what he says is that it's possible that or could it be that you having a near-death experience kind of shaped your acceptance that Marie's case was more genuine because you'd had your own? But what you're saying, it sounds to me like you, you went in just as sceptical as you would be if you, even if you didn't have a near-death experience, also think, perhaps. I'm not consciously aware that it was an influence. And that would be then true of all the medical professionals that also saw the shoe once I brought it down to the room. Right, um, right. Uh, that would be a, a, a lot of people on the same page. And that's probably statistically impossible that everybody dealing with Maria had had a near-death experience. So was open to it any more than mm. I was. I was part of a team. I just happened to be the one who was assigned to go look for this thing. But um, mm. it, it, it was, there was no precognition on anyone's part about even finding it. Sure. As affirmation of her own, Strobel brags that he only interviewed people who had nothing to gain and a lot to lose by talking about their near-death experiences. Clark went on to establish a near-death study foundation, wrote a book about the experience that is popular in Christian circles, has a speaking tour, and been interviewed many times in all mediums. She's become quite popular and famous for a social worker. This so we know what the implication is there. Yay, social work. I get to be a star social worker because <laughs> we're so in demand. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I enjoy it though. I'll, I'll tell you, um, it feels really good to be me. I mm. love these shows. I love addressing audiences. I love being on television because I reach more people. And my goal is to, again, bring comfort, um, validation, um, and information to people who are struggling with this. Not everyone who listens to me is struggling, but those that are, uh, 
I'm really happy to be a part of reaching out and helping them. I'm a helper. Mm. So no, actually no. Yeah. My agenda, by the way, not, you know, okay. Not another, financial gain. Mm. Wait, I have another confession. I do like being funny. That's not social worky. Why hasn't he picked up on that? And dang, she'd make a good stand-up comedian. I wish that had been brought up. That I'll own, but uh, that's not his point. Mm. So, yes, yeah, certainly your motivation isn't to be well-known or to have financial gain from your experience. I remember you said at the start, you know, you've yet to see these riches coming in from these events. Yeah, I, you know, and this... Yeah, this comes up, this came up yesterday online on Facebook, where somebody, you know, questioned the motivation of um, uh, people who have a near-death experience and talk about it. And it's just, you know, after all these decades, all I can do is just clunk my head against my wooden mm. desk here and go, oh my gosh, people, get informed, just inform yourselves. Um, but uh, I... I, even those who seem to be making a lot of money from popular books, good on them. Why not? Um, people are earning a it, It's Are they taking It's not this, yeah. I don't think so. But that's no. my opinion of other authors. Indeed. And it, it's, you know, the success or lack thereof financially or, you know, getting your name out there of a book is not tell of the motivation behind it it just tells that the book did well whether you know depending on what the regardless of what the motivation was so if the motivation was to fabricate something to make money and it did well that's not good if your motivation was to share your story and help reach other people but it also did very well that's a totally different thing and doing very well quote unquote it depends on the publicity department of the book house if it's a published book by a business not self-published and the buying public Mm. and how well the book is written. Um, if I, I am going to get defensive on one thing, or it's going to sound that way, and I, because it is. I didn't write after the light because I even wanted to. I was drug into it, kicking and screaming. I'm a good writer, but I hate to write. It's a chore. Um, but I was working on another project with uh, a film company, and they were doing a documentary on somebody who uh, on the East Coast, uh, no one I knew, but uh, this person had had an out-of-body experience and they didn't know how to film it. And so the uh, one of the producers went to somebody in Seattle and said, can you, you know, help us with this? They said, oh, you go to uh, Santa Cruz, you know, California, and you'll find out more there. And he did. And there said, no, no, get back to Seattle. There's Kimberly Clark Sharp. She runs this near-death group. She's right there in your community. She can tell you you know, she can help you with that aspect of the film. And so I was hired to do that. I was like um, just a resource. Then at that time, uh, and this was for a public broadcast station, uh, BBC would be the comparable organization, you know, nonprofit. Uh, at that time, it was popular also to have a uh, accompanying coffee book, coffee table size book. Mm -hmm. but with mm -hmm. a that was again popular during that time and so they wanted me to write a companion book to that aspect of the documentary it's like no and they said yes and so they set me up with uh, two agents and uh because i needed representation uh legally from them they couldn't represent me and so i met with them for an interview and it stunk i was terrible i tanked darren it was awful they were bored looking at their watches carrying on it's like i'm not this person then they asked a question and the read it it was over we all knew it it wasn't this was dead not near dead it was dead but mm -hmm. then well if you could write a book about anything what would you write and i came to life and i said oh i'd write about myself i would call it the woman who would not die and because i've had other horrendous health problems, cancer, you know, on, on, on. Uh, I'm happy to be alive and I'm grateful for it. And that's the book I would write. Mm -hmm. And they went back to the producers and said, you know, you got something here that you don't know about, but we want to represent her apart from the production. 
Um, is that cool with you? Yes, it was. And they became my agents. And um, I had help writing a proposal. And, uh, and then the proposal was sent to New York City. And it actually went to auction because one of the people endorsing it was at a number one bestseller at that very time. Betty Eady was her name. Is mm -hmm. her name still, still alive? So that meant money for publishing houses. So it actually went to auction. And at 2 p.m. West Coast time in the United States, the book was sold to William Morrow and Company. And I'm sure things haven't changed a lot on that level of publishing. Then I had to sign contracts like I was buying a house and they owned the book. That meant the sales department determined the title. I didn't. I didn't name the title after the light. It was The Woman Who Would Not Die. Um, they had all the editorial uh, authority. They owned the book. It was their book. So, and then they set me out on a book tour and then the publicity machine. I was just a cog in a commercial wheel for William and Morrow New York City book house. So I, I wasn't one then or now to ever go, I want to write a book. I still don't. Mm. Uh, it just was. And the book did well. I still get royalty checks. Um, I like money. I'll say that for the record. Well, not money itself. I like what money can buy. Yeah, um, what I you can do with it. Our mortgage with my husband, we, you know, combine our incomes. Um, I like buying groceries. I like shopping. I like vacations. I like raising children and providing for them. All that takes money. But that doesn't mean I did it for money. I just earned a living. Mm. And certainly, you know, having your book published with a with a publishing company takes out a lot of what you earn from because I'm in the process of writing a fiction novel and I've looked at all this and I'm going to go self-publishing because it's just, you know, as you say, there's so much paperwork, so much work and getting so little out of it that it just doesn't seem worth it. So certainly if you're writing a book, you know, and you publish it professionally, it's, you're not going to be raking in <laughs> the riches that you would expect no, if it does well. Rakes it in. Mm. Yeah, but they're Indeed. the ones who paid the money. They're the ones that pay the authors in advance. You know, I got an advance. I got a signing check. I got, you know, it's a business. It's a business. Mm. Um, and I was glad I didn't have to do any of that. I'm not a publicist. I'm, I'm poor at that. I'm... But I, and I don't know how to publish a self. I, I'm just not that person. Mm. I'm really glad that everything I just told you about transpired because it is a good book. I mean, I'll own that. It's funny and scary and sad and interesting and inspirational. She says with no ego whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> but Nothing it, wrong with being proud. <laughs> I have. I, I have no problem with that. I'm proud of my degree. I'm proud of after yeah. the light. It took me a year and a half to write that sucker and friends and neighbors to look after my family while I did it. It wasn't. Mm. Um, I've happened. been writing my book for a year and a half and I'm only about a quarter of the way done. It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard it is. for me. So, but I'm interested in what you're writing, Darren. So we'll talk later. Sure. Okay. Well, for now, right, let's continue. This is a theme among those who claim to have such experiences. Sometimes fame and fortune, sometimes not, but always affirmation and attention from their community. On a related note, the film's final NDE also comes from a book author. So I think that's it for the, um, oh, yeah. for the reissue. Wow, that's who, that's who Oprah's handing a mic to. Again, someone who in no way, shape or form was interested in money or attention. There's a great example on the screen of a near-death experiencer who wrote a very popular book that's still out there, very in-demand speaker, who became a pastor and mm. went from being head of an art department at a university with tenure to being a pastor at no tenure no 401k or any retirement system at one tenth of the salary. I'm so glad you're showing this. This is a perfect example of what the near death experiencers that I meet are like. 
Mm. And I think Howard Storm is one I'd love to have on the show as well to do exactly this, because again, that's a case I don't know about. So I couldn't really comment on this criticism of it. So I, hopefully I'll if, try and get in touch with him and do the same thing. It'd be interesting. But it looks like that's it for the Maria Shu case on this video. So let's stop that there.